so a few months ago, I was sitting across a table over breakfast with a young man who's new in ministry. <clears throat> and he was describing to me how insecure he was feeling and how doubtful he was that he could do it and inadequate that he was feeling and afraid and alone. And the more he talked, the more I found myself remembering one hot summer night in August 20 years ago when I watched the men who had helped move me into my third floor apartment as they got in their trucks and drove away. And there I was looking out the window as a single guy in the suburbs for years having carried a dream of starting a new church. But that was the night I really felt like a two by four hit me with the reality that my five happy years of serving as an associate pastor at a thriving church in the woodlands, rife with staff and resources and talent, that era was over. And now I had none of it, none of that staff, none of those friends, none of those resources at my disposal. And I remember feeling all alone that night sat down with a bowl of cereal and looked at the cereal and said to the cereal, I don't even know what to do now. What's my next step? I wonder, have you ever felt a little overwhelmed? Have you ever felt alone or wondering what now? What's the next step? Maybe you've been afraid. Maybe in a season of insecurity. Perhaps after a meaningful relationship ended in your life. Or when your dream got shattered. Or maybe after your position was eliminated at work. Or when you once felt betrayed. When a happy era came to its end. Or when a loved one of yours died. I remember talking to one lady who told me weeks after her mom died, I still feel like I'm in a fog and I just feel, I just can't move, move forward. And sometimes life just puts us in those situations, doesn't it? Situations that feel crippling with loneliness, fear, anxiety, or it's kissing cousin depression. Often in those moments, we hear a voice that starts to whisper inside of us, you'll never move on from here. It's only going to get worse. You can't do it. You don't have what it takes. Well, if you've ever felt any of those feelings, you're in good company. It's nothing new. As a matter of fact, today we're going to talk about a man who surely felt all of those feelings more than 3,000 years ago. His name was Joshua, and he's going to be the character whose life we're going to be studying in our new Courageous series. So let me remind you who he was. For 40 years, Joshua had served at the right hand of of Moses. Now, when it came to leadership, Moses was the goat, the greatest of all times leaders. Deuteronomy 34, 12 tells us that no one ever showed the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all of Israel. And Moses had a protege for years, and that was Joshua. He'd learned from the best. Joshua probably in his younger 60s when this story starts, he could remember vividly 40 years earlier when as a young man, probably about 20, Moses at the age of 80 had stood eye to eye and toe to toe with the Egyptian Pharaoh and confronted him in the name of the one true God. Joshua, he remembered that, and he remembered how 40 years earlier, Moses had, had led the Israelites out of Egypt that famous night of the Passover. And Joshua had stood there watching in awe as a young man, about 20, the night that Moses had raised his staff toward the Red Sea as God parted those waters before them. And Joshua had even journeyed halfway up Mount Sinai with Moses when Moses went all the way up to meet with God and get the Ten Commandments. Moses 
and Joshua, they'd known each other very well, trusted each other greatly. He was Moses' faithful assistant those 40 years. But now, Moses was dead at the age of 120. Gone. That era was over. Think of it this way. Nobody knows exactly when, but someday Tom Brady and Bill Belichick will walk off into the sunset and retire from the NFL. So just imagine, how would you feel if when that happened, you ended up standing on that famous field of Gillette Stadium in Boston because you had just been named the new head coach or the new starting quarterback of the legendary multiple Super Bowl winning New England Patriots. If that happened, I think you could be forgiven for hearing a little voice within whispering, you can't do it. This is a hopeless assignment. That's surely how Joshua must have felt the day after Moses died. Oh, theoretically, he had known this day was going to finally come and he would eventually take over. But when it finally got there, it just felt so much bigger than he'd ever thought it might. One writer put it this way. Remember now, Joshua wasn't leading a troop of several Boy Scouts into Canaan. He was leading a population the size of Houston, which would have given him about two million reasons to feel pretty insecure. And those were the people who were on his side. Joshua was actually one of two men who had lived long enough to remember 39 years earlier when Moses had sent 12 spies into that promised land because Joshua was one of the only two who had faith that day. And God had let him and Caleb live while saying the rest of you, you'll die off. Only those under 20 will go into the promised land. So Joshua, he'd been in the promised land. He'd spied in. He'd seen those Perizzites and Hittites and Canaanites and Amorites. And he knew they look like giants. They're huge. He knew they're wicked. They're evil. Terribly intimidating. They were known for witchcraft, idolatry, sexual orgies, sacred prostitution. And they were even known to sacrifice their babies in their idol worship. So... You could forgive Joshua if his knees were knocking a bit underneath the robe he was wearing that day when Moses died and God said to Joshua, you are my next man up. Now with that background, let's read from Joshua chapter one, starting in verse one. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you'll be on land I've given you from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. Nobody will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses, and I'll not fail you or abandon you, so be strong and courageous." For you're the one 
who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Don't deviate from them. Turning either to the right or the left, then you'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, I hope you noticed that phrase that came three times. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. It's a wonderful phrase, but the more I studied it, the more I found myself wrestling with a deeper question. How? I want to be strong and courageous. We all do, right? But how can I be strong and courageous, especially when it feels like the walls of life are closing in? That's the question we've got to dig into and find answers for if we're going to move ahead into the life that God has in store for each of us. Gratefully, the passage we just read doesn't just tell us what we need. It's going to tell us two crucial resources, which if we will draw on them, will give us that strength and courage that we need. So if you're a note taker, here's the first of the two. God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous because my presence will be with you. Look again at verse five. Nobody will be able to stand against you as long as you live for I'm gonna be with you as I was with Moses. I'll not fail you or abandon you. Joshua, you don't have to grit your teeth or muster up some courage from within. You can be strong and courageous. Why? Because I'm gonna be with you. And that's the greatest need that all of us have deep down, isn't it? To know that the one true God, our creator and our savior would actually be with us. Several nights ago, I went and visited two of Faith Bridge's oldest saints. Jack and Sammy are their names. They're approaching 90 now. Sammy's on hospice with metastatic breast cancer, and Jack's signs of leukemia leukemia are recently elevated again. So I'd gone over that night thinking, well, they surely need a little bit of ministry from me. But when I left their living room, an hour or so later, I was the one who'd been ministered to. Just sitting in their presence and experiencing the Holy Spirit in our midst. So I said to Sammy as I was preparing to leave, how do you want me to pray for you? And she said, Ken, just pray that I'll continue to feel the Lord's presence right up to the very end. And I thought, that's what we all need, isn't it? That's what we all want. That's what we all need to know that he's with us. Isn't that the very thing that Jesus, as he hung on the cross in that moment when all the sins of the world were transferred onto him, having come to live the life of perfection that we couldn't live, he goes to the cross to die as our substitute and those substitutionary sins are transferred to him. And do you remember what he said in one of those, one of the saddest words he says from the cross? We hear him say, Father, Why have you forsaken me? For in that moment, even the heavenly father had to turn away from the son. And it's the presence of our God that we need to go on. When difficulties come or calamities occur, when it looks like the sky's fallen in or the bottom's dropped out, we need to hear the Lord say to us, I am still with you. Child of mine, I'm right here. 
I've never left and I'm never going to. I'll be with you always. And we can take that to the bank. You know why? Because this isn't just a promise that's told to us in the Old Testament among heroes like Joshua and Moses. No, no. It's a promise that moves right into the New Testament as well. Starting in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23b, when God said of his son who was soon to be born, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then you go to the very end of Matthew, and he forms this perfect inclusio, meaning sort of like bookends. What's the last thing that Jesus says as he gets ready to ascend back to the Father in 2820? He says, and remember, I'll be with you always. So it's a promise that stands good even for us. Need more proof? Go to Hebrews chapter 13, 5 through 7. There's several. So perhaps you're going through a tough time yourself right now, maybe a divorce or something that's a little bit overwhelming. If so, maybe the Lord, I think the Lord probably did bring you here today because he needed you to hear him say, say, I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to be with you always. There's no circumstance that could ever knock him off his heavenly throne, muttering to himself, boy, I just never saw that one coming. But we can forget that, can't we? We can forget that. I told you several years ago about a situation that I was just thinking about as I was writing this. One of my sons who several years ago was, um, we were driving along and he asked a question, just that kids ask their dads. And he said, so dad, who was at Faith Bridge before you were at Faith Bridge? I said, well, nobody was at Faith Bridge before I was at Faith Bridge because I got there first. And so uh, <laughs> that's, he said, it's just kind of like the synapses connected that day. And he said, so you're the boss at Faith Bridge. <laughs> I said, well, I guess you could say so. We don't really use that terminology because, you know, really we're here to serve the Lord and all of that. But he was like, huh, I never realized you are the boss at Faith Bridge. So we drove along. Now, that part of the story is just set up for the thing that happened several weeks later. I was driving the same son back here to church one Wednesday evening for his curious Bible study with the youth ministry. And about halfway between our home and this church, uh, he exclaimed, oh, no. I said, what, son? He said, I forgot my Bible. And if I don't have my Bible, I won't get the points that I need to rack up to, so I can get the free T-shirt at the end of the semester. And I said, no, son, no, no, no problem. But we'll just turn around and we'll go home and we'll get your Bible. No, he said, don't turn around. I said, well, why not? He said, I don't want to turn around because if we turn around, then I won't get there early. And if you get there early, but only early, you get open gym and you get to play basketball. Oh, dad, I, what am I going to do? Why did I forget my Bible? He's just freaking out. And I'm sitting there right beside him and starting to chuckle. Because I'm thinking, wait a second, do you not remember that conversation we had a few weeks ago? <laughs> we're, we're actually going to the one little place in the whole wide world where your dad has a bit of influence. I even have an office there. And in that office, I think I got about 20 Bibles. I could spot you one, you know, or I could text one of the facilities guys and ask him, could you run a Bible down to the room he's going to be in? In fact, if we didn't even get the Bible, I think I could probably figure out which closet has the T-shirts in them. <laughs> but he had totally lost all perspective and Subsequently, he was sitting right there, right next to me, freaking out in the moment on a small scale. I think that illustrates very well, doesn't it, what you and I do on a larger scale with our Heavenly Father. 
so often. We just fail to remember he's right here with me. The sovereign father, all powerful, all knowing, all loving, the one true God of the whole universe, creator of heaven and earth and savior of our souls. And if that weren't enough, Isaiah even tells us that our names are written on the palms of his hands. He's promised us over and over, Old Testament and new, I'll be with you always. So when we're freaking out, perhaps what we need to hear him say is Joshua. <clears throat> Joshua. Frank. Nancy. I'm right here. Yes, it looks big. Yes, it looks overwhelming. But I'm right here. And I'm never going to abandon you nor forsake you. I'm going to be with you always. How do you find strength and courage? First, by remembering that he promises us his presence. And then secondly, God tells Joshua, now Joshua, I want you to take heart because I'm going to give you my word. In fact, I've already given it to you. Not only do you get my presence, you get my word. Didn't you notice, Joshua, that for the years you were protégéing under Moses, so often he was coming alone beside himself to me, and I was giving him what you'll call the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Why do you think I did that? because he had nothing better to do? No, so that you could access it and many who would come after you. So look again at verse eight. Study this book of instruction continually, Joshua. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. You have my word written, Joshua. And that's all that you will need. Now I want you to study it. And meditate upon it. You see, Joshua, he wasn't expected to fill Moses' shoes. He was never expected by God. He was never asked by God to be the same man that Moses was. But he was expected to follow the same guidelines. If Joshua was going to lead God's people into the promised land, the only way that he was going to be able to do it was to use God's roadmap. And the roadmap is contained for us in his word. In other words, Joshua, it won't be enough for the priests to carry my word along and for them to guard this precious book. No, 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 no. You've got to get into it. You've got to read it and meditate on it and memorize it and study it and do everything that it says. I think one of the reasons that so many people's lives are frustrated, defeated, melting in fear and weakness in this day and age is because they're not doing verse 7. If you want to be successful in everything you do, don't deviate from my word, turning to the right or to the left. If you want to be strong and courageous, stay in my word. How could we do what he tells us to do if we never look to see what he said? It's the lack of study, don't you realize, that results in the lack of obedience. And our lack of obedience is what results in our lack of fruit. And it's our lack of fruit that results in our lack of victory. And the lack of victory results in the overarching lack of courage and strength that we have within, that you see in so many people today, even those who profess to be followers of Jesus. I'm thinking of a friend that I had back in that Woodlands church I mentioned from years ago. <clears throat> he was a great guy. But his life just went from one defeat to the next. He was, and he was perpetually wrestling with anxiety. And so I asked him one day, are you reading God's word every day? And he said, no. 
I don't read God's word. I, I've never done that. That's never been a part of my life. I think he had grown up in a certain kind of church or denomination that just never really turned to the word of God. And I said, well, I, I guess we can sort of look at how that's working out for you. So why don't we try it the other way? How about we try it God's way and get you into God's word? Who knows? Maybe you'll discover that life starts working right when you look first at what he's already said to you in his written word. Plus, reading God's word can't possibly make your life any worse than it already is. So why don't you start in the book of Luke, I said. Just take one chapter a day. That's in the New Testament. There's only 24 chapters. And then at the end of that assignment, I want you and I want us to get back together. And I want us to talk again. And we did. And it was in that season that things started to turn for him. In the right direction. And he began to meet the Lord in a personal way. And today that man leads a vibrant ministry to the incarcerated population. But what about you? Are you reading God's word every day? Are you like the son of mine with whom I was in a disagreement the other night? I knew that he needed to be working on something that at that point in time, and he wasn't working on it. And finally, he just looked straight at me and he blurted out, Dad, I know what you're saying is wise. I just don't want to do it. Well, I started laughing too. And I said, well, then, <laughs> bud, good luck with that. I guess you're on your own. And at times I'm afraid the Lord has to say the same to us. If you'll never read my word, you're going to violate my principles. And when you violate my principles, you'll be pushing against the goads. You know, our God, he doesn't do consulting. You know what a consultant does. Consultants fly in and they give you advice. And you can take it or you can leave it because either way, the consultant's going to get paid and he or she's going to get back on the airplane and fly home. But God says, see, I don't do consulting. You can take it or leave it. I do truth because it's only my truth that changes lives. His commandments, they're not burdens, friends. They're given to us to protect us and to guide us into life full of blessing and full of abundance. So I see a lot of people, and maybe they even started out well in the faith, but somewhere along the way they get sidetracked. Sometimes by good things. They just got successful or they got a career that took off or maybe it's their sports or their children's sports or hobbies or, or whatever it might be, but they, they begin to lose their focus in God's word. And over time they begin to drift from that foundation of God's word and their outsides look good, but their insides are no longer fortified. They're crumbling on the inside. And the promises of his words start taking second place and third place and fourth place and more to other activities. You know, by the way, who suffers the most when this happens? Your children do. For now, they're not even being taught the foundations which could bring their souls into an abiding sense of ongoing strength and courage for their lives. Oh, friends, don't you realize, parents, our job isn't to get our children into Harvard or into the NFL. It's to get our children to meet and walk with the one true God. That's what our purpose is so that they might be sustained throughout this life and right into eternity. But how will they ever walk by faith and not by sight if they've never been taught the word, as 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. God says in Isaiah 55, my ways aren't your ways and my thoughts aren't your thoughts. So you better read them 
or else you're going to guess wrong. This is a book that contains all truth and all guidance for our lives. It covers everything. It talks about our money and how we handle that. It talks about our relationships and how we do those and marriage and parenting and talks about our sexuality and how to make that work right as well. But if you keep putting it aside, brothers and sisters, you're on your own. Don't be surprised when you end up spinning in circles. You want life? You want to be strong and courageous? God says, read my word, study it, ponder it. Meditate on it. That's, well, that's a word that means mutter, just muttering it all. It's sort of like a cow with a cud. And then do it. Live it. You say, but I don't know where I would start. Well, you could do what I told that man in the woodlands years ago. Take the book of Luke. If 24 chapters is too long for you, why don't you take the book of John? It's just two over to the right or just one over to the right, and it's only 21 chapters. So you can knock that out in three weeks clean if you take one chapter a day. And the great thing about either of these, they're gospels. Those are New Testament books, and the focus is our Savior Jesus, the Word made flesh. So start there, and you'll be off and running in a good direction because in Jesus, every promise the Father has made was completely fulfilled. So step into the word and find some friends to do it with and get in a growing group community so that you have some people that you're taking the journey with because it's his word that contains his promises to us. I love the stories of Greek mythology and you remember how those three bird women called the sirens would stand on that jagged cliff and they played their instruments and they sang their beautiful songs and the sailors were consistently drawn by the beauty of their voices, just certain that they must be beautiful women. And they were drawn to go off course, at which point those boats would smash into those jagged cliffs and rocks. And the sirens, who were not beauties at all, but only sounded that way, were actually savages. And they would kill the sailors and they would plunder their goods. And so the Greek hero of mythology, Ulysses, knowing this, he sailed with his crew successfully. How? by stuffing their ears full of beeswax so they couldn't hear the sirens' songs. And they made it through unharmed. But there was one other who made it through. And that was Orpheus. You remember his story? I love that one because when Orpheus' ship started to pass by the sirens, he just started singing. Everybody knew Orpheus had the most beautiful voice in the whole world. So to counter the songs of the sirens, Orpheus just began to sing. And all that his crew could hear was the voice of Orpheus singing. And lesser songs just lost their appeal at that point. I find it interesting that when the early Christians got together in those catacombs meeting underground to try to avoid persecution in the first centuries of Christianity, those Christians got together and when they would talk about our Lord Jesus meeting in those catacombs, they pictured Jesus in their paintings on those walls holding the harp of Orpheus. Why? Because they pictured Jesus singing to them the songs of truth. And through those paintings, the Christians were reminding themselves, just listen to Jesus. 
Listen to his word. In him alone is real hope and peace and life because his word is always true. It's always honorable, always right, and always pure. So fill your minds with God's word, friends. For only there will you discover his promises. And I want you to know those promises. Particularly when your life hits hard times. So much that I've even given you an insert that you were handed out that just has about 30 or 40 of them on there that you could just take with you and you could just read those to remind yourself. And I hope that you will. If you missed it, the ushers will give them out to you on your way out. There's also a devotional that you can do as we take this journey with Joshua the next few weeks. But I want you to read those promises and cling to them and memorize them and discover, discover alongside Joshua that you're growing strong and courageous. And surely, like Orpheus, you'll sail forth from victory unto victory. And that's what I want for all of you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the word that you give to us, for the fascinating story of characters like Moses and his protege, Joshua. Thank you for the charge that you gave to Joshua, saying, now you're my man up. But you don't have to go on your own strength. You don't have to muster the strength or the courage. You can be strong and courageous because I've equipped you with my presence and I've equipped you with my word. Lord, that's a word for all of us. I want to pray, God, for each person who's hearing my voice right now. Just knowing that there's any number of us who we get distracted and we hear the songs of the sirens and we start swerving off and, and we start crashing in our lives and it's because we got distracted and we got away from your word and we're missing out on your presence. And so no wonder there's such pessimism and such hopelessness in our culture today. But God, we're a different people. You've called us to be different we who follow you, Jesus. And so my prayer is that every single person hearing my voice right now would recommit themselves and re-surrender themselves saying, I want to be in on studying your word, reading it, learning it, memorizing it, drawing my counsel from it for all of life. I want to experience your presence, God. Your saving presence. And if you're here today and you've never even trusted in the saving presence of Jesus, you've never trusted in that Savior who came and lived that life of sinlessness and died that death of punishment for you as your substitute so that he could conquer the grave and give you life. Why don't you just right now in this quiet moment, why don't you just open your heart and say, I want you to come in, Jesus. I'm asking you to come in. Transform me. Change me. Fill me full of your spirit. Give me your presence. Give me life so that I can walk in ways according to your plans and purposes. And I pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.